The city of Atlanta has a human suffering problem. That problem is called homelessness. What are we doing about it? I'm Dr. Ralph Basui Watkins. Let's talk it out. So much of today's public discourse involves yelling, interrupting, and attacks designed to hurt someone rather than hear them. Whatever happened to dialogue that builds bridges? In the Christian scriptures, the book of Romans, chapter 14 and verse 19, it encourages us to pursue the things which make for peace and the building up of one another. That is the approach I will take as we engage in conversation on some of the most crucial issues of our time. Again, I'm Dr. Ralph Basui Watkins, and today we're addressing the issue of homelessness. It's a difficult conversation to have because it is a humanitarian crisis on which more progress is needed. We have two outstanding guests today who will share their thoughts on this issue, as well as the work they're doing to address this issue here in the city of Atlanta. We have Atlanta City Council member and candidate for mayor, Kwanzaa Hall, and Terrence Lester, the founder of Love Beyond Walls. Welcome to Talk It Out. So Kwanzaa, let me start with you. I mean, you're running for mayor, you've been on the city council. I mean, what do you think government's role and responsibility is in addressing the issue of homelessness? We definitely have a stake in this three-legged stool. Uh, I'd say Atlanta's been great at building buildings, but not so good at building and loving its people. That might be true in many cities around the country and around the world. The poor will always be with us, it says in the Bible, but how we address and try to help and empower the poor is what we have before us. So, so Terrence, when we think about this, you know, when we talk about the role of government, I think about the role of the church being a pastor. Yeah. But I mean, is, is it bigger than government and the church? Or is it just us? Yeah, I love uh, King's, uh, I think he coined a phrase, the global village. Mm -hmm. I think addressing any systemic issue takes all of us uh, because we're all affected in some way. Um, and people tend to look at uh, poverty or homelessness as that's the government's responsibility or that's the church's responsibility, but really it's all of our responsibility uh, because when you relinquish your responsibility, uh, you're not joining in on the fight against the issue. So what, what does that look like? When I think about responsibility, you know, he's talking about responsibility. What's your responsibility, Kwanzaa? One as a council person, one as a candidate for mayor, one as a citizen of the city. Yeah, well, also I represent the heart of the city, in particular downtown Midtown, Old Fourth Ward, Emmon Park. They're more homeless in Council District 2 than all of the council mm. districts wow. combined. Wow. We have three hospitals, we have a lot of social services, the train stations, the hotels, there's money there. So if you're looking for help, you're looking for supportive services, we have great churches like Wee Street who've been serving the poor for a long, long time. Our responsibility really is to be that convener, I think, to be a leader, to be the steward. It's a stewardship role. And we can do a lot. We can do a lot like we've just done with the housing, uh, creating a housing opportunity bond, as well as homeless opportunity bond. So we can provide some supportive services. We can provide some housing. We can also organize and arrange and bring people together who might not otherwise be in the conversation, whether it be the business community, whether it be philanthropic bodies who didn't know that Atlanta needed some help or who didn't know this is the way to direct their help. And then, of course, it's bringing all citizens to the table. Everyone is homeless is related to someone else. Yeah, yeah I think of that, I think, I think of that when, when I, I think about those who I've met or those in my family who've experienced trials, tribulation in their lives, that when I see these folk, I never lock eyes with somebody who's not in the family of God, who's a part of my family, right? That I am responsible for them, that I love them and care for them. I think it's a, as a pastor for church, I argue at the foundation of the gospel, it's to liberate those who are suffering, to, to tackle mm -hmm. issues of injustice, to ensure that those persons who are going through tough times and hard times, that's our responsibility to touch them. And I know, Terrence, with your work, you know, Love Beyond Walls, and with your new documentary, um, Voiceless, give me a sense of what brought you to the conversation. What made you make that documentary, Voiceless, which is amazing, by the way? Uh, yeah, we work in, in the trenches um, probably seven days a week, and we work among the vulnerable population. And um, man, when you really look at the landscape of society, you really don't hear a lot of the stories. You may see numbers or data, but like, how does those, how do those, how does the stats flesh out in somebody's life? Well, it fleshes out when a single mom has to walk two miles just for diapers, 
or it flushes out when a homeless person can't go in a public space because they may have a stench and the restaurant owners don't want them there so they kick them out. They don't have any access to water. It flushes out when a senior citizen may walk seven miles, right, for a bag of groceries. Uh, because they're living off of less than a hundred dollars at the end of the month so when you really think about the stories um, what we wanted to do with the film is humanize those who are suffering and on the margins uh, because once you humanize someone you see them for who they really are as instead of seeing them as an issue there are people going through problems they're not problems yeah i tell my church you know this person isn't homeless this is my cousin my brother my sister yeah. who's experiencing homelessness yeah. and that my love is connecting with them that's going right making those connections makes a difference so kwanzaa give me a give me a sense that you know i think sometimes i was downtown the other day at city hall we were trying to get approval for a sign to put in front of our church which we got but I thought about, you know, that grand space. And sometimes when you become this kind of public figure, mm. this sometimes can isolate you, right? So like every day at the church, when I go to church, I take time to touch folk and walk with folk. So many times you go to church, go in the building, and you come back out and go to your car. And it changes you to connect with folk. Give me a sense of how do you feel um, you have and will continue to make those connections with the folk that Terrence talked about, these stories, these real life people. Yeah. Well, you got to be your real self. Mm. Um, I decided a long time ago, actually, I was on Mount Sinai. And I was on the Middle East travel seminar and spent about three weeks there. And there were some big issues in the city. And some folks called me from the business community and said, Kwanzaa, how do you feel about this issue? And I said, well, I'm on Mount Sinai right now. <laughs> and um, God told me to make decisions in my elected life um, that do not conflict with his will mm -hmm. as best I can. And at that moment, and that was several years ago, I decided that I had to stay in touch with people, even more so than I think. So even when you think you shouldn't go say hello to that person, that's the moment you're supposed to touch the human spirit because you never know what God is going to give you back in that same moment. And you can't judge anybody yeah. because it could be you. It could be a family member or you're supposed to be that person who can give that hand at that moment or those positive words. So when we were growing up, we used to say uh, he who has I mean, I'm sorry, let me say it this way. He who does not have a smile is he who. Ah, I can't get it. I lost it. Yeah, but, Sorry, but, but, I'll remember it. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. when we come to you, just throw that in. I know for me, I was, I was sharing in, in, on this past Sunday, um, talking to some brothers and sisters who hang around the church but don't come to church. And after talking with these brothers and sisters, um, the issue was they need a place to take a shower and some nice clean clothes away to church. The brother said, I want to come to church like that. And mm. I thought about my being in touch with this brother, in touch with this sister, help me understand what they need from me, not what I think they need. Right. They really don't need my dollar. I can give them a dollar, five dollars, ten dollars. But the brother really said, I want to come to church. Rev. Mm -hmm. But the issue is I need to take a shower mm -hmm. and I want some nice clothes. Mm -hmm. So I said, cool, I got a shower in my office. I don't use a shower. Here, you can mm -hmm. use a shower. Uh, and I bought the brother some clothes. And I thought about it made me see him differently. But if I had walked past him, I would not have connected with him in a very real way. When I, when I, when I, when I see Jesus doing, mm -hmm. he don't walk past folk. He, he mm -hmm. always stop and touch. But when he touched folk, something happens. There's a transfer of power. There's a connection. I think that issue of the touch is so important. And Terrence, a part of your story is you made yourself homeless <laughs> to get in con contact with that experience and know that story. Talk to me a little bit about that motivation and what that did for you. Uh, yeah, I mean, living as a homeless person in the city, I did it for a little over a month. Um, slept in Tent City. Uh, I didn't have any resources. I went through every single experience uh, that someone experienced a homeless would have to go through. I remember one night, it was 19 degrees and it was projected to go down into the teens and I was under the bridge and uh, me and my homeless friends, we, we walked to a, a near Waffle House and we had to stay up all night uh, just to have a place warm because if you fell asleep in the restaurant, they would put you out. Um, it was a lady sitting across from us, she fell asleep, they put her out, it was seven degrees outside. Mm -hmm. Uh, by the time we reached Morning Man, uh, when we walked out of the restaurant, when the temperature rose again, um, my body just felt like, like it had been run over by a truck. And I have this thought, how in the world am I supposed to think about a resume or getting myself together when I'm just thinking about what I'm, what I'm going to eat this morning or what my body feels like right now? I don't have the physical strength to. Um, because your mind is constantly focused on survival 
every single second. And I think the window of time that people see in homeless individuals standing at a corner in that eight second window, they forget when they ride by them that that's their entire lives every second of the day. Um, so it gives you a different perspective. Um, when you take off your shoes and really put on the shoes of those in which you are uh, planning to serve. Yeah. 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 I think that sometimes my um, complaining of when I come home and it's the, uh, I'm trying to change my relationship with my app on my phone. Yeah. I complain about my being uncomfortable. You see, living in the street or carrying all my belongings yeah. in, a, in, a, in a suitcase. And, you know, I, sometimes I, I'm concerned about my water pressure. Mm. But I got a shower every day. What does that mean, right? How do we connect? Mm -hmm. So Kwanzaa, before we go to break, give me a sense about the bonds that, 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 that have been um, passed uh, during your term on city council to really kind of address some of these issues. Mm -hmm. so, so, and I have to, you know, give credit to Mayor Reed for having the leadership and the will to actually see us pass bonds that are greater than any amount we've ever done in the city. Uh, the Homeless Opportunity Bond will be 25, 27 million plus another 25 from the um, philanthropic community, so $50 million towards supportive services, and then another $40 million for housing, mm -hmm. so we can really do the affordable housing supportive services, because if you don't have a place to stay and shower, like you said, you can't even just get your mind right, right. and a place that's warm, and a place that's out of the cold, out of the heat. Mm -hmm. um, I think that is really the direction that we have to go in. And it's probably a whole lot more that we're going to need to do, but we can't do it by ourselves. That's right. We need the county to help us. We need the state in this conversation. We need the federal government. And we can let Atlanta be a model for how to do it right and share it around the country. And, of course, we need the church and others who just want to be in the conversation. We used to say, he who needs to smile most is he or she who does not have one to give. Mm -hmm. And we give a smile by using these resources the right way being great stewards over them and make sure that they get to the people. You can have a lot of money and you hear a lot of these big budgets, but then do they actually touch the people and can you measure those results? And that's what we need you all to hold us accountable mm -hmm. and make sure that we're doing it together. And right I now. love it. Well, this is an informative conversation and we will continue. Need to take a short break, stay with us. We will be right back. Welcome back. Our guests today are Terrence Lester and Kwanzaa Hall. We're talking about homelessness and how do we respond and our passion, our call, our responsibility to love and care for our brothers and sisters. So let, let, let's kind of get on a more personal level. I mean, what's our responsibility? How do people get involved? You know, what are you doing, Terrence, and what can other people do? Yeah, I mean, uh, well, currently we have a center uh, probably three or four minutes away from the airport and uh, we take the holistic approach uh, we address mental health, uh, temporary housing, uh, grooming services, uh, uh, health care. We partner with a lot of uh, organizations. We also uh, partner with a lot of schools, schools to uh, help resource families that are impoverished. And the reason why I say it has to be like a, a collaborative community um, approach is because, let's say for instance, if I walk to a center for resources to get like food, and uh, we discover that this person also needs mental health counseling. Well, we can refer them out, right? But they walk, so they have to walk all the way back home. They have to try to find resources to possibly catch public transportation to the next. I'm already hopeless, so I'm not gonna follow through with that. And if we uh, create these centers or hubs um, uh, that have a holistic approach to addressing systemic poverty, when we already establish trust with the client, then it's much easier to walk them through a process of self-sufficiency as opposed to, you know, uh, you go here, you go there, you go there, and if you don't have any transportation, it makes it really hard. So that's what we're trying to do as it relates to address, addressing systemic poverty from a holistic perspective. Yeah. What about you, Kwanzaa, things that you're doing personally? Well, I think it's um, kind of two-pronged. One, the small footprint approach, you know, what every one person can do, and, and, and that would be, I, there's a gentleman who has a business across the street from Wee Street Church, Ben Graham. Yeah. Ben was homeless. He used to ride his bike down the street selling all kinds of products and candy and things like that that people needed who were homeless. I tried to support him. Mayor Reed stepped up to support him. Now he has a convenience store. That's awesome. So from homeless to entrepreneur. Yeah. And he was in the music industry, so he just needed supportive help, and it was mm -hmm. kind of a one-off. But then in a macro level, you zoom out, Atlanta's rolled out a pre-arrest diversion program 
This is a program that I piloted. Uh, we found the funding for $250,000 focused on not having the police to arrest individuals mm -hmm. who might be dealing with mental illness, mm -hmm. substance abuse issues, may happen to be naked, mm -hmm. and definitely probably are homeless. Why would we take them to jail? For years and years and years, maybe decades in our city and cities around the country, there are individuals who've been arrested for crimes that sh they should not be arrested for. Mm -hmm. And they're in these, in these detention facilities, and they're hopeless. But now you're in jail. You're getting a criminal arrest record for being poor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's not right. Yeah. And it becomes a debtor's prison if you have failure to appear, and you have all these fines and fees. Mm -hmm. So we really are starting to pivot out of major. that way of policing and that way of treating our citizens. But this is just a pilot right now. That's we major. need to spread it throughout the city and That's have good. programs like yours to have the supportive services on a small footprint, not a massive facility, but lots of small facilities that people can walk into and regain their dignity. That's right. I like that. I, I like that approach. I've always said that about we're treating someone who has a set of conditions and problems as if they're criminal, but they're not a criminal, That's but they're right. treated as such, right? Hmm. And we had that at our church, you know, at Wheat Street, where people walk in on a Sunday morning, they may be naked or homeless, and we want to usher them out and lock them up. I say, no, let's deal with this. What's going on? Right. How do we help this person get from A to B? Not from A to jail, yes. That's right? right? Or from A out of the church. I mean, one of my, my first Sundays at the church, his brother came in, he was making noise. They're going to take the brother out of church. No, let the brother stay at church. That's right. I mean, I, I got a microphone. I, I'm, I'm on I, I'm going to talk louder than he's going to talk. We're going to just talk together, right? But I think that approach, how, how we think about folk, what they're experiencing. And I think when I'm getting to know folk, what caused this problem? What happened to yes. you? What's, what, what along your journey, if you was going, to, what kind of threw you off track? How did yeah. Because I think this holistic approach is what I, I argue as a, as a pastor. How, how, how we treat folk through this process, and then how do we how do we begin? As I think you're suggesting, Kwanzaa, um, how do we deal with systems that have systemically oppressed and hold fail folk locked in? Right, right? That's right. It's kind of dead as prison thing, right? You know. So 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 give me a sense. I know you have this um this mobile unit piece. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, uh, man, it it arose out of similar to what you're describing, uh, having a conversation with the individuals. Um, it started with a guy we met, he was sitting on a tree, he found out that he had been out of contact with his family uh, of 30 years. So imagine not being in contact with anyone in your family for 30 plus years. He was literally lost uh, without an identification and you need ID yeah, to get amazing. ID. Yeah. Um, so he was socially excluded. He had no one. Um, we had a, a couple that donated our organization an RV uh, it's this whole process of what are you doing with your excess, right? We all have excess in our lives that can be mm. repurposed and reimagined to solve issues that exist right before us. So if you, you're somebody that wants to do something, use your excess. But we converted the RV into a mobile shelter unit, um, providing temporary housing for this individual until we were able to reunite him with his family. And we've done this type of thing over and over, and we've helped over 80 people get off the streets. Um, sometimes uh, people need social support. Uh, I love what John Perkins says. He says, you can't give anybody dignity, you can only affirm it. Mm. Because it's already there. Mm -hmm. They have no clue it's there because they feel worthless. But if you affirm somebody's dignity and you build authentic relationships with that individual, you can use the, con the resources in the context of your own life to leverage that and uh, help somebody walk out of um, uh, out of homelessness, out of poverty, similar to what you guys did with uh, the gentleman that owns the store. Mm -hmm. Beautiful stories like that need to start happening right. all over around the city. And, and, I, and I think when I look at Ben's store, like we do a thing in our church, we have a community yeah. partner of the month. Well, Ben's been there for two months, and we serve, <laughs> go, we make sure our money stays in the community. Yeah. We, we go to Ben's store. That's good. But Ben's store even serves as a hub to help serve oh, persons who experience homelessness, right? It's amazing what he does mm -hmm. there. But as you were talking, I was thinking about something that John Perkins is famous for saying. John Perkins says, you never steal someone's dignity by giving them. You, you help them by walking with them. That, and then he that's says, so good. And then he says, of the best of leaders, when it's all and said and done, the people say we did it ourselves. Mm. Right? They just we. Affirm, we, 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 mm -hmm. we, that's we. Good. And I think the kind of sense of how do we as a city, how do we as a community, whether you're a person of faith or not a person of faith, right. how are we committed to ensuring that our brothers and sisters live the life they were created to live, right? That something happened and, and we have this responsibility to walk with them. Like, like you say, Ben Graham, who tells the story of living under 75, 
five, you know, stuck on crack and something hit him, man. Mm -hmm. And um, ironically enough, you know, I'm a photographer as well, and I had this image of the police, the, the, the very place he got arrested the last time, and the police arrested him. So he came to this, this photo show I was having at the Apex Museum, and that image was his image, right? Mm. Yeah, the wow. moment of transforming his wow. life, right? Wow. But I think, but here, here is the point. The point was, all that comes about by me staying on the street, mm -hmm. that by me, by me not going in the church and going to the office, mm -hmm. but going to the church, parking my car, and walking the street. So I think this issue of being present, this issue of having an incarnational presence with our brothers and sisters that begin to break down these walls. So Kwanzaa, give me a sense in a city like Atlanta, that's so divided mm. along race lines and class lines. You know, back, you know, your district in itself, the dynamics of that district, right? Mm -hmm. One of the wealthiest, prettiest parts of our city, but also the place where my church is, yes. where we have the most homeless. How do we begin to forge these partnerships? How do we begin to break down these barriers to build these relationships? I, I think we really have to reach across the lines that we've allowed to divide us. Mm. And it's so easy to be in the safe place. Yeah. And sometimes it's just across the street that you're divided. You can't even see that they're on the other side. And that could be a divide like Boulevard or a divide like the Beltline or, you know, very obvious divides are going on and people just drive by. And so what we began to do is instead of um, riding by it, we said, let's stop like you, you've done. Stop and find out what's really going on. Don't assume. Don't try to think that you have the answers because you can't just solve it by yourself. But ask the questions. Help me understand what's going on. How can I help you? How can I be, a, what can I do? And like you said, every person has something they can do in their own capacity. And then there's using the leverage of all of your resource, your family members, your friends. And sometimes it's just making a text message hmm. to someone else while you're standing in the moment with a person. Hey, let me give you the number. Here's my car, here's a number. When you call this number, if they don't call you back, you got my number. And you know I'm usually in the same place. Where will you be? Can I bring something back to you? I can't do it right. I mean, it's a lot of things we can do that we oftentimes are too busy. Yeah. Mm. To love, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. To be able to love people. I think sometimes I've always, I, I used to think that I was going to be this great savior of the world, right? I was going to help all these folk. And I realized those folk help me. That's yes. good. They make yes. me more compassionate. They teach me. They school me. They love me. Like when I get out of my car and they say, Red, what's up? And the hugs, the mm. loves, they embrace the stories they share, you know, sharing a, a turkey sandwich together mm -hmm. or having something to drink together, right? It's my birthday. I mean, the love you get back. And I think they, they've informed how I see the world. And some, sometimes help me create critique my own sense of privilege, yes. right? Mm. My own sense of wealth. I mean, I think I give away money, but still, man, I'm grossly wealthy, I think, mm -hmm. right? You know, I, and, I, and they make me realize, like, Ralph, come on, man, you don't need the new camera, right? Mm. You can make a donation to this organization. You can give this this way. They like, can see, creating that margin, man, they actually repurpose the wealth that God's blessing with, but, but sometimes it's a gross wealth. You know mm. what I'm saying to you? Oh, but I can just yes. go buy a suit when I want to go buy a suit. Bad I passion, want to buy a shoes. Yeah. Sometimes when I sit down with folks, say, look, yo, bro, you don't need this. You need to do this. You need to do that. You need to rethink. They help me see the world differently. Mm -hmm. And I sometimes don't realize how out of touch I've become. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that the walls of my lifestyle, the walls of my sense of being, you know, middle class, the walls of my education that I thought were to liberation had somehow kind of locked me up. And I had to almost fight them. And those folk, folk who I connect with, actually pull me out of my little safe little wall and space. Mm -hmm. So we talk about this, 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 this issue or these experiences of our, our brothers and sisters who are struggling. It's not one answer. It's a myriad of answers, right? A myriad of ways we can get in. So Terrence, help me think about one of the complexity of this particular uh, issue and the persons who are experiencing homelessness and poverty. And what are some other ways people can get involved? Yeah, sure. Uh, so like currently we're, we're housing uh, temporarily a guy that we're, our organization has been working with. His issue has been identification. He lost everything. So it was stolen in a shelter, right? and you need ID to get ID. And he says, well, how am I to get it? So uh, one of our volunteers, really great with research, found out how he could get ID. You know, it's through a agency here in the city, uh, the Georgia Law Center, and uh, they hire attorneys to solicit uh, for identification. But did you know that's an eight month process? Mm -hmm. Like not having ID, that means you can't get a bank account, you can't get a job, you can't uh, do some of the social things that you're a normal citizen would be able to do because you can't even prove who you are 
as an individual. Uh, the flip side of that is, I mean, it's, it's clear in the text, man, in the scriptures, uh, Jesus said, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. I love that. So that means you are the answer <laughs> we've been waiting on. I am, Kwanzaa is, Terrence is. We're going to have to pause right here, but I want to thank my guest, Kwanzaa Hall, Atlanta City Council, and, and a candidate for, for mayor. Uh, you can check him out at KwanzaaHall.com and Terrence Lester. Found of Love Beyond Walls. Check them out at lovebeyondwalls.org. Up next, my final thoughts. So here's what I think. As a person of faith, the issue of addressing homelessness, of addressing poverty, it's at the core of my faith. It's at the core of the gospel. And it doesn't just stop there. We also have to challenge systems that maintain these systems of poverty and oppression. We must create a country that everyone has an opportunity to succeed and live their dreams. And it's not just up to the government. It's not just up to the churches. It's up to us. It's about being a village. It's about being a community that cares enough to make a difference, whether we're serving, helping, or fixing. Yeah, three categories. Sometimes we serve those who are in need. I like at our church, we provide meals to those who are hungry. Sometimes we help those who are in need. We provide systems that begin to help them make it to the next step. And then sometimes we fix the problem by challenging systems and calling them to accountability to ensure change occurs. In our city, you know, we've closed down one of the largest homeless shelters, Peachtree and Pine. And while there's money coming into the city, is the money, money too late? While we're trying to fix the problem, we're going to leave folk hanging in the gaps. And when you see those folk, don't be afraid of them. Talk to them, reach out to them, touch them, love them, care for them. Realize you're locking eyes with someone who's created in the image of God. And when you get to know them, you'll know their story. You'll know their journey. You will know their struggle. Listen, it could be you. It could be me. When I meet folk who are experiencing homelessness, they have a story. And I realize they have come from somewhere. And you know what? I could be where they are on any given day. Tragedy happens to so many people. Let's not judge folk. Let's love folk. Let's connect with folk. Let's walk with folk. Let's help folk. Let's transform systems to ensure our people are set free. We also want to know what you think. Take time and write to me. I really mean this. Write to me at programming at AIBTV.com. And guess what? Follow me on Twitter. And guess what? I'm the pastor of the Wheat Street Baptist Church. Come by sometime. Visit us. We're trying to do this work in the city. Have the conversations to make a change. Remember, if you talk about it, you might actually change it. Let's talk it out. We'll talk to you soon. <laughs>